Doctor Who Scratch Man by Don Baker Figure Running Part 3 Chapter 7 As Sarah had told me later, she didn't dawdle on her way back to the tar- way to the TARDIS. Night was cold and anonymous. She looked out of the moonlight sky and admired the way that the stars were reflected by the sea almost like they were trapped beneath it. As she crept along the shore towards the TARDIS, she felt herself relax. Yet the island may be full of etrich horrors, but it was also held at certain beauty. Sarah grinned, remembering her colleagues at Metropolitan Magazine. Travel was always something you did with the aid of a brochure. It might. It took a fortnight. Your luggage would go missing. A hotel cooking didn't agree with you. Instead, Sarah travelled from one planet to the next. Never the same sky, never the same suns, never the same sand to squeeze between the toes. All that time, there were no guided tours, no trips, no planning, but an awful lot of adventure, no souvenirs, and definitely no time to send postcards. Postcards, although, having said that, a few years ago, we see the mysterious postcard at a desk. But a grim, rainy day, when a postcard had arrived, it was dog-eared with a faded view of Mauritius and a 1924 postmark. A really odd thing, but was a message on the back. You'll do all right, it said, in her, in her handwriting. Sarah reached the meadows, kicking her way through the sand remains of our picnic. Fairly reassuring shape of my time machine, perched just around the corner. Home. Her blue box had parked itself directly, overlooking the beach. She patted it. She shivered. There was something not quite right about the machine hum warning. She risked a glance over her shoulder. No, nothing behind her but the empty field and the beach beyond. She looked back at the TARDIS. What if something lurked behind the ship? There seemed to every move, waiting to pounce. She forced herself to smile. She was being silly, silly, and yet she remembered me saying somehow Think to her about the TARDIS being telepathic. What it, if it what was it trying to say? Plucking up every scrap of courage, she sneaked a look peek around the left side of the box. Nothing. She checked the right. Also nothing. Not yet daring to relax, Sarah locked the door of the box. Warm, bright, friendly light spilled out. She slipped inside and closed the door behind her. Only she didn't quite close it. A figure slipped from the shadowy head and inserted a finger of bone into the door. Sarah stepped through the tiny wardrobe door into a large hotel lobby of space. She always found it impressive. She'd been seeing straight far ship flight desks and cinema. A gun metal grey bristling with buttons. Not so the TARDIS, I'm pleased to say. As everyone knows, the controls of the TARDIS were concentrated in a tiny pedestal, not much bigger than a desk. We left plenty of room in the control room for a homely collection of chairs, a hat stand, and a cuckoo clock, which is just how I liked it. My TARDIS had been built to go places, but she did it so in a woman's circle spool. Sarah crossed over to the control console and tapped one of the few buttons I allowed her to touch. A screen glowed on the wall with a few more presses, presses of lit map lit up, showing her where to go, look for an Enteron power pack. Fine, said Sarah, second workshop. Sarah was going down a rickety spiral staircase. Despite the size of TARDIS didn't do lifts, instead... Her taste ran into an endless winding set of stone steps, halfway between a magician's turret and stairway on the London Underground. Sarah stopped counting all the eighty-one odd steps, and only left her feet to take care, take her. Much the best way with ships in dimensions, I find. The tightest rooms are constantly rearranging themselves like ornaments and haunted bookshelves. I'm oh, sure that's how they're supposed to work. But we've grown used to each other's corporates. 
The art is to enjoy the journey and accept what you've given. But that's part of the fun. At the bottom of the staircase, Sarah saw a poster from a Buster Keaton movie, a little illuminated sign indicating the workshop. She turned left and found herself in front of a tiny door. It had the number 23 on it in brass letters. There was a little box, a door knocker, a little fake stained glass, a clap flap. Clearly an Ecocade Avenue somewhere had woken up with one day missing its front door. Sarah opened the door and stepped into an echo ring hanger. She got a feeling of the size of it from the old biplane tucked away in a far corner. I guess this is the workshop too, she remarked to herself, stepping over an abandoned train set. In the middle of the room was a small secretary desk. She opened a bureau, rifled through some unpaid bills, starting off from the media digest, located as hidden drawer, covered with old pencil sharpenings, and a push the drawer I sprung open, a cleanest, whitest light she'd ever seen, filled out of it, and each little pliff rose from the inside of the desk, and it nestled three glowing grain cubes. Anton Prax, said Sarah happily to herself, and took one. She turned back and made her way glumly to the spiral stairs, only to find it had been replaced by an exocolator. Thank you, said Sarah. Sarah stepped back into the main room of the TARDIS. She was whistling again. The tune died in her throat. The familiar hum TARDIS had gone. The ship was silent. Her footsteps echoed. There was a cold breeze stirring in the air. The door to the outside was open. Mist drifting in. Sarah stopped dead in the tracks, but I thought I closed the door. Five and at the time, back in the church, I felt a shiver down my spine. I didn't know it, of course, but it, something had crept inside my TARDIS. Chapter 8 Excuse me, what are you doing? A tiny, fluffy woman was leaning over me. She loved, looked tired as though everything about her her grey hair to a pale grey skin on a spinster green cross lines. You know the wash once too often, yet despite the darkness, something about her spot again grinned and continued assembling a makeshift recreator, co- 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 a nice quiet corner of the church away from the suspicious glances Miss Furrock. It's just a woman continued to her soft moaning side tones. I've told you, breeding supermans apparently devour the, sup- the staircrow's compartments. I t- f- nodded. Forgive me, but that's how moths work, she said. Not currently. Indeed, that's what's to stop them from attacking the mouse. She allowed herself a tiny smile by attacking our clothes. I leaped and stopped. Do work on my reticulator. Gave her my full, delightful attention. First inquiring mind, first intelligent question had been asked, and I sniffed the air. I noticed the organ had stopped playing. Yes, the little woman flushed modestly. I am pleased you were enjoying my modest playing. You played it so excellently. My complaint, compliment was genuine. Thank you, Mavis, Mrs. Farrick. She doesn't. Doesn't like me to play. The woman admitted. She commandeers the organ at most services and does it so really well, most admirably. She refuses to learn the new settings of hymns. Good to keep them going. Conveniently traditional. I'm sure she is. The lady has ascended a gloved hand and I should took it. I'm the doctor. Delighted to meet you. Mrs. Mofia Moderat. And she prompted with gentle firmness. You're going to tell me some more about this machine of yours. It looks hardly original. Well, it's resume work on a particular. Let's call it a mighty moth machine. Mark 1. Mark 1, sympathy BCA, leant over the machine and nodded approvingly. Not sure there'll ever be another. You have a quiet mind, sub BCA, I exclaimed, looking up from the coat later. Not inquiring enough, she lamented. If I miss my home... Being turned into a living nightmare. 
Whatever alien intelligence that emanated in scarecrows, it's cunning, conviving, and terribly clever. She startled. Alien? It works, Charlie. Turns your isolation on this island to its advantage. It builds its forces slowly, so you wouldn't see. Alien sympathy concentrated greatly on this. Doctor, you sound as though this is probably rude of me, but you do, you do sound somewhat alien yourself. Somewhat, I agreed genially, genially. Oh well, she smiled a daintly smile. If I can accept the islands overrun by living night scarecrows, it is not so hard to set the Martians look like members of the rooms reset. It would explain Virginia Woolf's cooking, I agreed. Outside the great, the great churchyard, a crowd of scarecrows stood, ghastly heads tilted back, sucking away the night air. Three of them staggered away, picked up something heavy, and tottered towards the perch. There came a loud and heavy pounding on the door, church door. Barricade of pews jumped. What are the scarecrows using, do you think? So, so Felicia asked. I pitched in tombstones. Are they perhaps using one of the, them, the battering ram? Is that too ghoulish of me? I looked at her. It is well as to be prepared. The thumping continued. The beats are getting fewer and fewer, further between. Do you think it'd be safe for us to seek out there? I shook my head. It would be like a ham sandwich running towards a Labrador. Oh dear, Mrs. Morritt frowned. What can you tell me about the island? I asked her. It had pr- never seemed a happier place, she confessed. Then when I came here, I thought it was the most beautiful place on earth. There's something in it, a feeling in the air. It was a terrible history. Does it indeed? I put down my screwdriver and gave my full attention. Her most full attention. Tell me, she's in my favourite kind. Oh, yes, going back to the four Saxon times. Our cottage is found in a remarkable preserved Viking boat buried out in the harbour. The crew, crew was still on board. A drowned rowing away from something. So the story goes. So often does. There's a whole history of plagues, of curses, of Lorraine's. James the Sixth thought a spell been placed on it. it. Took great joy in the people here. None of them lasted long. Others came here looking for lost treasure. Didn't find it, did they? Oh no. But their deaths gave rise to a fair new few sage shanties. This place has a terrible reputation among sailors. There's a Spanish galleon out beyond the sandbanks, joined by fair few wrecks during the last war. Fascinating, I told her. I think there's been something wrong with this island for a considerable time. What sort of thing, she asked. We both looked over to the door, resounding the anonymous beat of tombstone against the oak. Oh well, Mrs. Moret, indicating me at my spalling machine, so tell me more about how this contraption is going to save us all. I'm afraid I seize a chance to show off, even if it were just an audience of one. But all these moths are going to live as terribly fast my bullet rate. This machine will accelerate their life cycle by several hundred percent. Poor dears, you know that moths breed quite quickly, don't you, Mrs. Morritt put in? So, if you speed that up, well, yes, there is a tiny chance that their creatures could descend like a biblical plague all across our Europe. I see, a tiny, a very tiny chance. I hold up my finger and thumb. Hardly any risk at all, certainly compared to the last machine I built. Anyway, I'm trying to train the moths. You are? At the genetic level, what I really need is some microscope. You have, all I have is a discarded pair of reading glasses. Do you, so having a microscope is important, said Sophia. Moseret nodded, straightened, and shuffled off to the vestry. Out of the corner of my mind, I could see Mavis Furrick. She was standing on the front, peering through her window into the gloom of the churchyard. She did not like what she saw. She was scared. For the first time in life, she did not feel in control. She ruled this island for almost her adult life. For all that time, she'd never been scared or confused. Things she didn't understand had always as it is, she'd get out of her way, poor Mrs. Farrick included. She spent the next last few weeks refusing to believe the order of things as changing. Now she found herself adrift and oddly, oddly unaware 
reassert herself. From time to time, a villager approached her to ask what was going on. She heard herself snapping in familiar words. I don't know. She could see the effect on this was having on villagers, and she didn't relish it. Nor did she admire the way I decided to talk to Mrs. Morissette into my confidence. Something she decided should have to be done about this. She slid off to the front front and showed it over to Harriet Mac Evan. One of Sarah Fishwife, she ran to old age or custom. I'm not one for gossip, of course not, replied Harriet. Leaning in, but if you ask me, our Mrs Morissette is already unfamiliar by new rivals. What did she know? Mrs Morissette Moret brought in a bag and handed it over to me. You said you needed a certificate question instrument, she said. This is in the jumble cell. I plucked a box from the bag. Every boys and girls first science science kit. It includes a microscope. I think it's broken, said Mrs Moret. And some slides, but they're none too clean. It comes from Harry Perkins. That child is quite a devoted nose picker. I see I eased the corner off the box, looked inside, then slid it all, all to one side. My attention was riveted instead by what the initiated might conclude was their cup or an icon at the bottom of the bag. Ah, wonderful, a flea glass. Probably the vicar's, Sabadida remarked. He was a bit of a botanist. I screwed the flea glass into my eye like a jeweller. Back to place of Coadador Diamond. Superpetia, I said gravely. I'm going to try re-sequence the DNA of entire species for little more than a magnifying glass. Do you think you can do it? I got her somebody. I have to I shall have to squint. Mrs. Tullifarek slipped from group to group, topping up tea here, handing out slices of bread, butter there, also, that would garnish a mistrust and mis-suspicion. Wherever she went, another nervous glance would wander over to me, my machine and terribly attentive Mrs. Moverat. Mavis is getting restless, said Pavidia's tone was warning. I can tell. When she thinks she's been on the phone for long enough, you can hear her tutting down the phone line. It's most distracting. I looked up from my glass. I'm sure she doesn't. Miss a thing. If only she could isolate new drama genes, we'd be in business. Mrs. Mogoret smiled and cleared her throat. I rather think it's us she's trying to isolate. You may have to stop a moon to thee. I followed her point in hand to where Mavis was bartering to all three old fishermen, casting an acid glances in my direction. Occasionally exclaimed moths, the men would murmur in agreement. I had started enough rebellions to recognise the scent brewing. Something clearly needed to be done. I put down my microscope and strolled over. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, I gestured to the hole in the window. That's our weak spot. It need to be airtight. Find something to block it. A tree tray would do, but no failing that, use your imaginations. The fisherman nodded and started casting around. For something to use, they made some suggestions, all which I agreed with hotly. This, as I intended, provoked Mavis Farrant's ear. She started to come up with four different things that, as everyone could see, would be vastly better for fixing a broken window. But of course, I exclaimed Mrs. Farrant, I didn't know how you you do it. Superb. How it revealed me. Suggest plumbing and gap with a tea tray. I defer to you, I really do. Splendid. Keep up the good work. And I wandered back to my machine, favouring so for bees here with a big wink. Must be done, whispered Mrs. Mossat. That brought you some time. It has, it has, hasn't it? I said, squinting again in the glass. There's no tea tray big enough to keep out that the winds of change. By the way, where's your friend? Good question. I'd look up for my work. Wor- worried. They've been gone a long time, haven't they? T. 
Chapter 9. At the moment, Harry was creeping through the abandoned streets of the village, trying to follow the directions I'd given him, while repeating my instructions. Watch out for scarecrows. A creaking voice attracted his attention. In the shimmering moonlight, the figure peered through the fog. It was a policeman on his bicycle. Harry had an instant urge to hold the figure, but something in the jerky gaunt of the figure and a strange glow that poured from its head pulled him up sharpish. He ducked behind a water butt and watched the policeman approach and sail jerkily past. I say, exclaimed Harry, a scarecrow riding on a bicycle. That's quite something. He had felt a moment terrible pity for the policeman who found himself so outlandishly transformed. Almost a amount of childish wonder. That was the thing about Harry Sullivan. There was no malice in him, just an urge to grin at everything, until he grinned back. Harry watched the ghastly policeman pedal away. Then a broken from cover headed towards the village door, took up the sky, looked up the sky at the hunter's moon, piggy for the clouds, and said grateful thanks for its light. It helped him to find the shop without too much of trouble. The light street was quiet as a grave. He rattled the door. It was locked, of course. Mrs. Parrot was too careful. He felt in his pockets. Where was that key ring? He didn't notice, but a figure stepped out of the Shadows behind him was a scarecrow dressed in a fisherman oilskins. Harry sniffed. There was a strange tang into the air. It was been a bit sharp. He realised it was the smell of blood, fish and bone. He failed to find the key. His pockets and went round again. Left jacket, pocket, right jacket, pocket. Figure behind Harry stepped closer. Under the hood, a skull peered out. The jaws opening. Harry found the keys at last, two of them, and of course, a lock. Harry picked a lock, key, tried it in the lock. The figure took another step towards Harry, showed it, stretching out his arm, the bleached ash. Harry, no joy, Harry gave a little touch of familiarness of the world and tried another key that didn't fit either. The scarecrow pulled was savouring a moment. Then a terrible skull began seemed to grin. Harry went back to the first key. For some reason it worked now. Well, wasn't that just his luck? The scarecrow lunged. Harry opened the door and stepped through, the, through smiling, and the old Johnny twinkled a bell above the door. The scarecrow followed behind him, bony fingers, brushing Harry's shoulder. Shivering slightly, Harry pulled a torch from his pocket, turned it on, weaving it around the village store. He had a rack of magazines of newspapers. Why, there was probably his own paper there. There was the end sign, dear old Jack Hawkeye, preparing for adventures with the chaps the first remove. Seized with a soldier for forgotten titled hero, Harry stepped forward to pick up the paper. The scarecrow followed. As he did so, the edge of its oilskins caught against the old latch of the door. Scarecrow lunged, the coat pulled away, pulling apart well-worn swings. For a few moments, the scarecrow continued to lunge, but his exposed body wood and bone crumbled away to dust. Harry, lost in childhood, put aside his tisements of the ensign. Something, a noise, a groan, a clatter, and recalled him to the present. Stay awake, Sullivan. He tried it himself. With a renewed purpose, he f- headed for the grocery. Counter stepping over the oh, so, so he presumed someone had le- left lying on the floor. He advanced over the counter, waving the beam of his torch across the supplies. He saw half a shelf stacked with bags of sugar. Splendid! When Harry had f- failed to notice, well, Harry had failed to notice, it would he failed to notice quite a lot, with another scarecrow creeping through, in through the door. This one was wrapped in a tattered dress, a widow's bonnet. The scarecrow was desperately hungry. It grasped a poor Harry like a beggar after arms. Harry, oblivious as ever, swung up the counter flap, ducking through the flap, not the scarecrow back. Harry marvelled at the groceries on display and rushed forward to help himself. 
The scarecrow rallied and lunged again. Harry let the counter door flap drop behind him. The flap caught the edge of the dress and yanked it from the frame of the skeleton. For an instant, the scarecrow stood there, a bundle of sticks and a bonnet. Perplexed, it reached out for the Harry. Then it turned to dust. A few minutes later, Harry had armfuls of sugar. He piled the little paper packages up in the counter and toppled the pyramid off of a jar or two of sweets. At first he went for mint humbugs, but then plummeted for jelly babies. He knew I'd approve. Harry regarded this whole proudly. Well done, Solomon, to himself. He tried gathering it all up and realised by an, he had rather more than the rants that sack had brought with him would allow for. Seemed ashamed to leave it all behind. He threw his torch beam around the vanished doors, and his eyes had lighted on a promising side door, which led to the outhouse. He stepped past the girling water closet and into a small garage upon the elements. It was piled high with firewood. In the corner was a scythe, a coil length of hose, a joy joys, a wheelbarrow. You just, just a, you're just a ticket, Harry Sullivan told Wilbur and seized it, bouncing it into the shop. Behind him, a figure moved out of the darkness of the shed. It was wrapped in a cloak of an old sheep's skull for a head. It paused to pluck up the scythe and fluttered after Harry's silent and deadly death. Harry was loading up the wheelbarrow, his torch. Perched up on the counter, motes of dust dancing in its beam. It's stifling the urge to whistle jointly. Jointly. Things are going jolly well, and not a peep of scarecrow. Sometimes he thought the doctor really does over egg the pudding. Dear old Harry. Loading done, Harry grabbed the wheelbarrow and began to negotiate a path at the shop. The wheelbarrow bumped up against something. He pulled it back and yanked it around. Round. Behind him, the scarecrow with a sheep's head raised his scythe and whistled it through the air. Harry bent down to hoist the wheelbarrow up. The scythe whispered over Harry's head, snicking up at the side tips of his curls. A moment later, Harry lifted up the wheelbarrow. Marvelling at the balance, the squeak of its wheel masked something squeaking, creaking behind him. He wheeled about and made for the door. Behind him, the scarecrow made ready to swing his side once more. A rear barrow jerked to a stop. Something was wrapped around the wheel. Harry bent down to see what it was. The side ripped through the air where Harry's head been, but Harry didn't notice. His attention was firmly fixed on the old rag, whatever it was, caught up in the axle. Harry gave it a yank, pulling it firmly free. There was a satisfying terry noise. He found the rag was in fact part of a long and dusty cloak. How odd that Mrs. Farrack would should leave all these old clothes lying around, dusting his hands. Harry threw the raggedy cloak to one side. He straightened up, wheeled his way violently towards the door. Time to get back to the church. Behind him, the deluded scarecrow still clung to its side. It totted around impatiently, and then dissolved into a mould of dust. The sigh swayed in mid-air and clattered to the floor. Truly, he missed Harry Sullivan lived a time life, or at least he had up to this point. He had up to until this point. <laughs>